My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. And I'm Tom Scholey. And we're going to crack open a David Magikelly uh, interview that takes place uh, right when he's in the midst of creating Batman Year One. First, Jimmy, what do you have? Join me on patreon.com slash Jim Rugg, where you can download out-of-print zines and mini-comics like this 2013 Street Angel sketchbook that reproduces actual pages from my sketchbook, as well as some commissions and different drawings I was doing of the character then. I post a lot of original art on my Patreon. Uh, script page is basically the process of how I make the comics I'm working on at the time. Uh, in this case, Street Angel, Octobriana, and uh, I don't even remember what other comics I've done in the past that are on there, but uh, a lot of content posts. So join me on patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Tom, what do you have? Here's Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. Uh, learn about the, the life story of the guy who created uh, you know, so many of the great comic books that, that, that we know and love today, including uh, the Fantastic Four. I did my version of uh, Jack Kirby's fan and Stan Lee's Fantastic Four in Fantastic Four Grand Design. Tells their whole story in, in, in one handy, uh, spectacular volume. You can also check out the new comics I'm working on currently on my Patreon. Go to patreon.com and search Tom Scholey. And I have a YouTube channel called The Total Recall Show. Red Room Comics in the Wild, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit, name of the game in the Red Room universe, and every issue is completely self-contained, so if you see an issue, scoop it up. There are three on the stands right now as we speak, and they each tell complete stories. Uh, as of this recording, it's not quite uh, Free Comic Book Day 2021 yet, but on August 14th, the release of the Red Room Free Comic Book Day comic uh, hit the stands, or will hit the stands. All original material, get your hands on those. Uh, if you want to read the comics before they hit paper, go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks get you the archive there. Well over 100 pages of comics, and we're into serializing the uh, the, the fifth issue of comics uh, as we speak. Fellas, it was pretty fun uh, recently cracking open this like old Frank Miller interview where he was in the midst of creating um, Batman Dark Knight Returns, and I thought that there was some there was some cool proto language before things were solidified into like prestige format and like what is a graphic novel and things. Uh, have this issue of Amazing Heroes laying around with the Mazzucchelli interview in the midst of uh, coming off of Born Again, setting pencil to paper to do uh, Batman Year One, and pretty cool interview for us to unpack and have a conversation about. Yeah, and, and uh, one of the things I learned from this interview is just how much of a collaboration that he has with Frank Miller, not just like for, for like the, the um, you know, finished form, like the comic itself, but just uh, like the scripting, that the story, I, that, that they would kind of like throw stuff back and forth in, in like a very, at a very early phase of things, uh, you know, talking about uh, uh, Batman Year One. Mazzucchelli's a favorite of the channel. We've, we've covered several of his, his works and they're... Well, ultimately, we'll be getting into his body, of, like his complete mm -hmm. body of work at some point. Uh, one, because there's not that much, it's easy. it would be easy yes. to do uh, some critiques and comments on all of his stuff. But uh, this interview uh, gives some good backstory to, uh, to his genesis in becoming a cartoonist. Uh, one of the things that I took away from this is that he is a pretty, he thinks like, an, an artist who is interested in the comics medium as opposed to like maybe even us who like were interested in becoming cartoonists and using that for all of its worth. So he has these outside interests and, and points of view. Uh, he starts off, they talk about the influence of, of Kirby, Ditko, Cole, and Buscema, but then he starts to uh, expand his uh, his eyes as, uh, as uh, Howard Chaikin would call it in our shoot interview. And that was pretty illuminating, no pun intended. Yeah, there's some interesting origin bits. Uh, mm -hmm. This is really a fun interview because I don't know how much he had been interviewed up to this point, but they're asking him stories about you know, how he breaks in, getting responses from Jim Shooter based on submissions, uh, getting away from comics until college, at which point he sees Frank Miller's Daredevils. Uh, his roommate has them. And that's what pulls him back into comics where he's like, wow, these are impressive, good to read, good to look at and leads him back into, essentially into this career making comics. So kind of cool to get that backstory of yeah. like directly Frank Miller's the guy that brings him into comics in terms of interest. Um, not the only guy that I've seen talk about that. Like uh, Joe Quesada's talked about that with Dark Knight Returns. I've seen some other cartoonists talk about specifically Miller's work being the piece that brought them, drew them back to comics. Well, I mean, like Barry Windsor Smith was kind of like further along in his path than 
than Mazzucchelli was at the, at the time of, of this interview. But, um, you know, he, Barry Windsor Smith talks about how, like, he, he kind of gave up on comics, seemed like kids, and then he saw um, Alan Moore's Miracle Man, and then that kind of brought him back to comics. So it's like this kind of, like, wave of, like, more mature or more, like, accomplished comics bringing, bringing some, some people to the table who, who might not have been interested otherwise. It is fun, like, seeing his submission stories, because he's submitting to Marvel and DC. Both are a little bit interested. It's like, who gives him work first is the key to, you yeah. know, what directions he's going to go and, and continue to pursue. Uh, you don't hear these these stories that often anymore, so it's kind of neat to see Mazzucchelli, of all the guys, mm -hmm. working his way through the submission system. And you, I guess he's doing, like, Indiana Jones first. Well, he does that issue of uh, Masters of Kung Fu that, that, oh, I, yeah. that I do have in the long yeah, box, that. man. <laughs> and I think he's, uh, because it was a late job, I'm not sure if it's, like, Gene Day just passed and we need somebody to fill this yeah, comic like right Could away I, I think it's real close uh to that but uh it was a rush job needed to be done quick and i think it was inked by vince coletta so so <laughs> all the ingredients <laughs> yeah 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 it's not something that mazzucchelli's very very uh fond of uh recalling and even here i think he's like oh man i was hoping you wouldn't bring that up uh he it's there's a classic thing that happened and we were prepared for that in art school where you uh while you're doing your submissions listen Take your freaking time. Make these things excellent. Make them the best you possibly can. If an editor asks, took me three days to draw these things, uh, your first job will probably suck compared to the, su the uh, submissions that you put in there. The important thing is to be trustworthy to the editor. Get the job in on time. That's exactly what he describes here. And because that job was a rush job, Turns out that he wasn't getting calls right away. And uh, I was thinking about stuff like even when I first connected with, with Harvey P. Carr and things. And I, I was like in my youthful naivete, you know, I was 21 or something. Got that call. And I'm like, oh, I'm in comics now. I'm in comics <laughs> now. Cool. I uh, was corresponding with him for about a year before the gig even commenced. Right. And then I got a four pager and he was like, thank you. And I'm like, now what? <laughs> I'm not in comics anymore. Yeah, what, what happens now? <laughs> Direct. That's literally what Mazzucchelli's describing. He did that job. It was done. Nobody came a calling because they were looking at that Masters of Kung Fu. If they seen anything, wasn't sexy, man. So he humbled himself. Just did more rounds of submissions, man. And you always hear like the legend of the new talent program that that DC had. Yeah. I think maybe Darwin Cook was a part of that. Uh, is that 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 the showcase books? I can't answer that. I, I don't know if it was a separate program. Because I think it was not. called New Talent Showcase. Yeah, there right? definitely was a new talent showcase yeah and cook was in that yeah so i think that that might be what the program is because the the, the the timelines uh sort of add up this is a fun story too because i hear so many people say this now you know this idea of like there is no moment it's not like you're suddenly in yeah right uh, it almost you know it just doesn't work that way but i think everybody who aspires to it believes that that there's uh -huh. some job some barrier that then you're in and it really doesn't work that way. Mm -mm. Yeah. And it's a good lesson to hear somebody of Mazzucchelli's stature say it because it's true. You're like, keep working. Keep doing those submissions or doing create-your-own work or whatever while you're trying to get whatever job you're chasing. Uh, very practical advice. And one of the few pieces, I think, from a submission standpoint that maybe has not changed in, in 35 years. Does the Indiana Jones book, uh, something that he liked because... His submissions weren't even superhero-ish, man. It was, it was, you know, civilians doing their thing, man. So that was like a logical comic for him to, to draw. And I, I have those issues around here somewhere as well. Uh, from there, starts getting some more calls, man. Yeah, yeah, this is interesting. Gets offered Daredevil, turns it down, doesn't think hey, he's ready Hey, I'm drawing yet. Star Wars right now. <laughs> well, you know, and it's the, it's the book that brought him back yeah. to wanting to make comics and he recognizes his own shortcomings and, and isn't ready for it, has to get asked more than once in order to accept it, which is, that's its own incredible story. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting move, too. You know, like, like it, it, it wasn't done consciously, but it is kind of like, you know, he made them sort of come to him a little bit. Those things, uh, that happens every now and then, man. You turn something down because it sounds a little corny, and then the, they'll say something like, what, is it the money? We could triple it. And right, like, yeah. Oh, God yeah, they damn sweeten it. it. Okay. Okay, sounds good to me. The first actual Daredevil comic to hit uh, the stands, the first thing that he really worked on was that Harlan Ellison mm -hmm. issue that we did make a 
kayfabe video about, dude, do you realize how deep our channel's going to get over time? <laughs> like, gonna, there's going to be a video for every... Like, you remember the old Marvel? Yeah. Asterisk. <laughs> yes. See this video. Uh, the, the Harlan Ellison, it was pretty much Harlan's first first foray into comics, so his, his script was far more ambitious than what 22 pages of comics could yield. And it was about, you know, death traps and stuff. And each death trap flows into the next. So they had to distill that down into 22 pages to get it to all work properly. And, you know, fun creative challenge. Probably showed off some of his plotting chops in that to make guys like Denny O'Neill tr trust him a little bit more with um, the story content part of their uh, collaboration. Talks about going doing some of these Daredevil stories while being in Europe for like six months, yeah. which is amazing, wild to imagine in the mid '80s. Speaks to what they saw in his work, man, because that's a that's a lot of hassle to go through. A lot of long distance for, calls for just some douchebag, and then you know trusting the mail system. Like what what is what uh -huh. is the. Uh, Italian to American uh, it's male go, relationship, it's go through like customs, even and... like the long distance phone calling. Oh yeah, you know, like imagine the bills they rang up trying to co-plot because I think he was co-plotting Daredevil at that point. Uh, yeah, it just sounds like a a tough way to work, but it also speaks to his how much of an art background he's coming from. They're in Europe because his wife is a painter and gets some sort of I don't know scholarship or or something to study painting there, and he goes with her. So imagine what they're looking at, what he's taking in. Mm -hmm. You know, he said like the first month or whatever, he's just working in a sketchbook. You know, he's just drawing what he's seeing and everything. Yeah. So uh, I didn't realize, you know, that's a really different perspective, I think, than most cartoonists are bringing. I, you know, I got all, I have all these issues, man. And I swear there's like an issue where there's like a, gon a gondola. Yeah, like you're right. In you're Italy. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so I, that, yeah. that must have been. This interview does make me want to go back through his whole Daredevil run. There's, there's so stuff good, they talk man. about specific issues and stories and things. And doing several of those issues while he's in, in Europe and I, Italy. I got those things in a box, like, you know, that my dad got at the at the flea market when I when I was a kid. And those absolutely stood out in such a big way. Never mm -hmm. heard the guy's name before in my life. And those things were exceptional. And, and the aforementioned wife is Richmond Lewis, Colors of Batman, Year One. And when we did the Born Again uh, conversation, there was a, a single issue or two that, that had David Mazzucchelli as colorist. And he reveals that it was, was pretty much Richmond Lewis who was doing the the, the color. Yeah, nice to uh, shout out that, that credit here because he is saying that uh, you know her first comic book credit, which is fucking amazing, right? Her first comic book uh, coloring credit will be will be uh, Batman Year One, yeah. some of the best color mm -hmm. ever to be done in the four color mechanical process uh, of comic books. Speaks to earlier conversations that we've had. Where, uh, you know, when we're so lucky to have people from, from outside culture just bring that kind of vision to our medium. Uh, he kind of actually speaks directly to that idea of the insular nature of, of comic book artwork, where he's taking in stuff from, from the, you know, the, the greater arts, capital A, art. Uh, yeah, he says that, you know, he thinks, or he, he would say that he hopes that art outside of comics has more influence on his work than art within comics, mm -hmm. and suggests that's probably a good... Uh, good thing for everybody to mm -hmm. do. Uh, I I agree with that totally. I, it makes total sense to me, and I don't think it just comes from art. You know, like I think about just the culture. design influence that that you know I have. Um, you're looking at something else. It's the same kind of stuff. We're all trying to communicate, especially if it's using words and pictures. Like you could draw from any of that. And he even mentions Dr. Seuss books as being an influence. And of course, the the interviewer is kind of. A little shallow, and it's like I don't even see that in your work. And he's like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. like, like a thing can influence you, right? Yeah, but you there's not to... a cat in a hat walking around in in uh, year one yeah. or something. How but... cool that they point out that exact image that kind of stopped us all in our tracks yeah. when we were going through that artist edition, and, and we name checked uh, Edvard Munch, uh, Scream, you know. Yeah, and man. he goes down like an expressionism path. So German expressionism connects Bill Sienkiewicz to it, connects cartooning to it on a wider scale, yes. and specifically, you know, that maybe being the apex and the Daredevil stuff that would reflect that that interest, that influence. But it's pretty uh, pretty interesting influence to bring out. I mean, it's it's a column of text in this interview, so he spends some time with it. He doesn't quite coin the the phrase "dumb line," but like the the the, the proto idea is is here in the conversation. What do you mean by losing a lot of the drawing? Getting rid of a lot of the rendering, man. Getting rid of the extraneous. And then this is the opportunity to bring up names like Chester Gold, mm -hmm. Roy Crane, yes, Alex Toth. Eat this up. Yeah. 
Absolutely love it. And what he says about gold, like the the genius of gold, and and you know, man, he articulates it. He's a, this is a college boy, man. So he articulates the vibe that like I feel like reading those Dick Tracy comics, where it's this complete world world view that that Chester Gold is able to create with the brush. It's it has nothing to do with the real world. It's about mark making and having one mark interact with the next mark and creating something believable unto that format. He yes. name checks uh, Charlie Brown and Peanuts right. and says something like, now if you saw this creature <laughs> walking down the street, walking yeah. in three dimensions, <laughs> you would be fucking horrified. Yeah. But for the context of the delivery mechanism of the Peanuts comic strip, it all reads perfect. No wasted movement, no wasted lines. That's some of the stuff he talks about when uh, the Toth name is mentioned. You know, um, he talks about what the initial idea for like Karen Page's role in Daredevil Born Again was going to be and that Matt and 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 Karen weren't going to end up together. She was going to throw this monkey wrench into his life, completely destroy his, and then he was going to have to have some kind of confrontation like oh why did you do it? but in the process of making this comic they kind of got that like oh we can like strip away all this extraneous stuff in Daredevil and like these two are kind of like you know perfect for they're they're in the same like period of life, you know and 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 can figure things out together. Like I, I thought that was because, like, I did sort of picture his relationship with Miller as being like script shows up, I start drawing. You know, I, I didn't realize there was that give and take. It is a full script when it when it comes down to actually putting pencil to paper on the issues, though. So that's clear. And that was a question that we had when we were looking at that artist edition. You know, is it Marvel method? Is it mm -hmm. not? Uh, same thing with Denny O'Neill when he was doing those Daredevil scripts. He had like essentially like a little movie script kind of gimmick. And had to, uh, you know, design his pages with with that in mind, with the latitude to do what he needed to make the to make everything work. The other artist or cartoonist that he brings up is Milk Kniff. Yeah, and I think that uh, you really see it in the Batman Year One stuff. Yeah, you know, an updated version, but yeah. still like this attention to shadows and stuff that feels very Kniff like. Yeah, and it's that heavy handed brush. It's like very clearly a brush stroke, but you mm -hmm. see them in a certain pattern, and now it's drapery of a bomber jacket or something yeah it's kind of cool to see those as influences whenever you think about i don't know 90s cartoon comic book artists and who their influences are yeah. i feel like it's very much more narrow rather than like i'm gonna look at this guy from 40 years ago and uh, and bring that into my contemporary superhero it, comics it's it's funny too because it's like it was harder to do then, I feel like. Mm -hmm. You didn't have uh, ready access to a lot yeah, of stuff. So. I guess there were NBM collections and stuff of, of Terry and the Pirates. I always remember looking at those when I was a kid. Like, wow, I would love to have all of those. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it was possible, but... The funny thing is, too, like, you think... I, I think of contemporary car comic book artists, especially like Marvel DC guys, as being highly influenced by Mazzucchelli. And I think the stuff that they're influenced by in a lot of ways does go back to the Kniffs and the Toths and this... The way he would approach black and white shadows, uh, even inking lines. Yeah, it's all about the delivery mechanism with which you, you discover the thing, right? So, like, we, we often, you know, as kids, right? Like, McFarlane, Liefeld, and then, you, and then later you discover Art Adams, Mike Golden, and then you discover Masamuni Shiro, and, you know, it's that educational process, man. Yeah, I mean, Scott McCloud describes that exact process in Understanding Comics. You know, the sort of, like, the shiny apple, and then you, you know... It's very casual. Uh, the interviewer asks him about how Batman Year One comes about, and he's like, Frank asked if I'd be interested in doing a Batman story with him, and I said, sure. <laughs> <laughs> More names, man. G Gilbert Hernandez, Trevor Von Eden mentioned as being uh, influences and in people that uh, Mazzucchelli digs. He gives some, some shine to uh, what specifically it is that uh, they bring to the table, and when he mentions Gilbert's name, it's exactly the stuff that we mentioned about the Chester Gould stuff. Like, mm -hmm. it's a, a, With the difference uh, being that Gilbert's work is about kind of the real world, but is able to create his own idiom that doesn't take away from that. You know, it's cartooning, but you're still dealing with real concepts, real human emotion, even though it's not Alex Raymond you know, photo referenced yeah. artwork. I, I could read Mazzucchelli describing cartoonists and their styles all day. Yeah. <laughs> These things are fantastic. Like, listen to this one sentence. This is for Gilbert Hernandez. His character and the world he's creating do not get stylized to a point that's comfortable. It's amazing. Like, that's so succinct and accurate. 
and he has those kind of notes for like any of these artists that he that he name drops he'll then describe what he's taking from them or what he sees in their work and they're spot on descriptions and really man the half dozen cartoonist names that he mentions it's a who's who. He's you a, put those pieces together in a blender, you have a super cartoonist. <laughs> he is a heck of a thinker, and this is something from 1986, right? So uh, we live in a day and age now where you could go on YouTube right now. Got to You want to finish this video first, of course, man. But you type in Mazzucchelli's name, you can find about three hours of his instruction uh, in front of a blackboard, in front of a wet board, with that magic marker, that dry erase shit, and just spilling out his ideas for free to the masses man like you you could you could do worse than spend an hour or two listening to him uh describe his thought process when it comes to making uh making pages makes me want to look at more trevor von eden also yeah after hearing his description of his work so unpredictable it's almost dangerous and that's <laughs> very exciting and Man, he, he he definitely sums it up. I will so seek accurate. out those videos of his instruction. Oh yeah, so so accurate to to Trevor as well. And once again, able to verbalize the stuff that we intuitively feel, uh, because Von Eden's work, like everything you see, is a little different than the than the other pieces. When he talks about man, if I had the balls, I would dress draw like Chester Gould. <laughs> I but I'm not there yet. Yes, <laughs> he gets there. You know, Asterius Polyp. Thinking of it through like a Chester Gould lens. That's a really interesting way to think about that book. Yeah. And that the, the, his art. Yeah, that like just <laughs> that Asterius Polyp character is like a, a Gould villain. Kind well, of, so a pattern is beginning to v develop here, fellas, with that Frank Miller piece that we uh, went through and with this Mazzy Kelly piece. Uh, it seems to be like there there is a kind of ravenous nature, right, of like the comics fan. And it's always, I mean, when we go to shows, right, like you work mm -hmm. for a year on a book, you have it to present. The question that gets asked the most, so what's next, right? Right. That's asked in the Frank Miller piece, and he's like, oh, I don't th know that there will ever be another superhero piece. Mm -hmm. That's asked uh, at the tail end of this. And, uh, you know, Baz Kelly's basically the same way, uh, has the same answer, too. Like, these are such rigorous, big pieces of work that they're putting together. Uh, and I can understand that they can't possibly see themselves ever putting in that time ever again. Yeah. Just, just look at your old comics and mm -hmm. tell me you don't feel like, man, I'm glad that I, I survived that one. <laughs> yeah, It's very true, especially the way they work. You know, you think of Batman Year One, they make an entire world. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's not a piece of Batman that they're visiting. That's right. not a fill-in issue. It's like they invent that entire world. So when you're done, it is like not just the final page, but also, okay, I'm leaving Gotham Year One <laughs> setting. I don't know what I'm drawing next, what world I'm going to draw and go inhabit. It is a big project. It is not you know, monthly fill-in. It's, yeah. it's something else that they're creating. And I think it speaks to the Daredevil story of, like, how that story changed from their beginning to the end. Like, he's aware of that. Yeah. So it, it would be probably pretty hard most of the time for him to say, this is the next thing. In the midst of it, too, like, you just can't think in those terms. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be fully invested in in this world and uh, to, make it, to make it as rich as it ultimately becomes. He does point out that he's going to do an Anosenti Marvel fanfare story, yeah. which we all we'll know is, mm -hmm. is that Angel story. We'll bust that out one time. And he does an X-Factor fill-in issue immediately before Batman Year One. Uh, we have both of those. I feel like now I'm ready to look at those two <laughs> as like bookends on Batman Year One. One of those pages, man, from that X-Factor is at the Billy Ireland. That was like one of the pieces that I would pull out. Uh, the Marvel fanfare uh, strip that we will pull out at one point, to me, that is that bridges the gap. That's the missing link from mainstream comics, David Mazzucchelli, and rubber blanket David Mazzucchelli because he plays with a lot of line. It feels Kurtzman-ish. In my mind's eye, it's mm -hmm. been a little while since I've seen it, but I, I, I remember like a, a, a bubbly ink line, a lot of curve, Yeah, you know? Um, clear knowledge of anatomy, but stylizing it. Thick brush, heavy brush. Yeah. Um, swinging that brush, you know, mm -hmm. wrist action, as Brendan McCarthy would put it. Yeah, there's a lot of great stuff in here. It makes me want to talk to former students of his. Yeah. You know, like we hey. know Benjamin Mara worked, yeah, man. Uh, worked with him. Uh, it's just, it's incredible. So I'm gonna, glad you point out the videos, Ed, because that's stuff that's relatively new to me and, and definitely something I intend to check out. One of the pieces I remember about the Ben, ben Mara uh, SVA tour was that uh, for a number of assignments, many assignments at the beginning, maybe the first half of like the semester or something, Mazzucchelli wasn't letting you use one word 
in your strips, man. Like, you have to earn the word, man. I like You need to be a visual storyteller off the bat, and then you, you earn, earn your words in your comic. That's so smart. That's sick. It makes me wonder where City of Glass fits into all of this stuff in mm-hmm. Rubber Blanket. Like, I don't remember the date on that one, but... Uh... It, this interview does make me want to just go back through his whole body of work. It's fun going through these amazing heroes, the comics, uh, journals, and all that stuff, and, and, and pulling out these these little bits, man. You know, that that's an interesting thing about earning the words. Uh, you know, cinema benefited from having an extended period of, like, forced silence. So they, they created their their visual vocabulary, you know, and, and comics never had that. Comics had word from day one, so... That's yeah, a really good point for people who, uh, you know, compare comics and cinema. Great uh, interview. Awesome conversation with you fellas. If you don't have uh, any final notes, we could bounce, man. And for those playing at home in the audio podcast uh, version, this is from Amazing Heroes number 102. K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, what's out there? Join me on patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Download out of print zines and mini comics there. Check out my original art, my scripts, my process, how I make the comics that I make at patreon.com slash Jim Rugg. Tom. Check out uh, Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics from 10 Speed Press. Fantastic four grand design from Marvel Comics. And uh, my YouTube channel, Total Recall Show. Red Room Comics in the Wild from the amazing Heroes publisher, Fantagraphics. Every issue is completely self-contained, uh, so if you see an issue, grab an issue, give it a chance, give it a try. If you dig it, grab another. You're going to get full full experience every time. Uh, you can get the uh, free comic book day comic and, and uh, have a sample of what Red, the Red Room universe is about. That's coming out August 14th. Uh, hit up my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. For $3, uh, you can get access to all of the comics that are uh, in the stores, uh, on the Patreon. Uh, new strips come out every Tuesday, and uh, the comics hit the Patreon before they hit uh, the paper edition. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below the video. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below the video. I'm juiced up to get back to making some comics, Jimmy. Given those marching orders, we're going to be on our way. Make more comics.